Today, I am thrilled to be joined by Dr. Brennan Spiegel, who is the Director of Health Services Research for Cedars Sinai Health System in Los Angeles and a Professor of Medicine and Public Health at UCLA. Dr. Spiegel is listed in the top 100 influencer lists for digital health and virtual reality. And this is what we're going to be talking about today, virtual reality and the role it has to play in medicine and treatments. We'll also be talking about Dr. Brennan Spiegel's new book, VRX, How Virtual Therapeutics Will Revolutionize Medicine. Dr. Spiegel, thank you so much for joining us today. I do believe it's rather early where you are because you're joining us from the far side of the USA. I am. Thanks for having me. I'm here in Los Angeles this morning. How, and how is it in Los Angeles today? Are you doing well? Is everything good? Everything's good. It's uh, it's finally getting to feel a little bit like winter. It's been pretty warm, but now it's uh, feeling a little cooler. So uh, every so often it actually feels like a season here in Los Angeles. Fantastic. Oh, that's brilliant. Well, listen, I, it's great to be talking you, to you today. I've been researching into what you've been doing. And also we're going to be talking about your book as well. But I'm going to start off by asking you a very basic question. Are we talking to you today about virtual reality or virtual therapeutics? And are they the same thing? And if they're not, how do they differ? Uh, yeah, they're, they're one and the same as I think about it. Um, so virtual reality is a technology. When most people think of virtual reality, they think of a gaming platform where, you know, teenagers are playing first person shooter games or something like that. Um, and it is that, but VR is much more than that. VR is a platform that allows us to nudge the human brain in different directions. And it could be used um, for gaming and entertainment, but it can also be used for therapeutic purposes to help manage pain, for example, reduce anxiety, help with depression, help with rehabilitation after a stroke. So the way I think about it is VR is kind of like a syringe. And what I mean there is in medicine, it's not the syringe that matters. It's the medicine that goes through the syringe that matters. The syringe is just the the conduit through which the medicine passes. So VR is just a platform. What matters is what software are we using? What are people seeing, feeling, experiencing with that headset that we can then use to help improve the health of people? Okay, well, just your reply there has sparked up a whole other set of questions and we're gonna to come to those in a second. But I was watching you, uh, your, your discussion with us just a while ago uh, and you talked about I want to get to the down to the real basics of, of uh, virtual reality because you talk about taking a virtual reality trip where you're standing on the on a platform on the side of a building and you are coached to jumping off this platform to essentially to your death whilst in this virtual reality I'm really dying to ask you uh, Dr. Spiegel, how did that feel? Did it really feel as scary as you described it? Yeah, anyone who's used virtual reality knows this sense of psychological presence that it achieves. Unlike any other audiovisual medium, what VR can do is essentially trick the brain into thinking that it really is present in some other world. Even if intellectually you realize that you're not about to jump off a building or not playing some kind of game in outer space, your brain doesn't really know the difference. So it accepts what it's given. And so this story you mentioned is one where I first used virtual reality. I was standing on the side of a 50 story building in a window washer rig. And then the railing, the protective railing falls off, crashes to the ground. Uh, and they asked me to just jump off the building. And I said, no chance, I'm not gonna jump off this building. I, I mean, I don't wanna die. And they said, well, you know that your feet are standing on carpet, right? And I said, well, my brain knows that, or at least my feet know that, but my brain does not know that. Uh, my brain thinks I'm about to die, but I eventually did it. And the only way I was able to jump off is I had to cheat. I actually looked through a little um, opening in the headset I was wearing and I could notice the carpet and that was enough to break this illusion that I actually was standing on this building. And even with that, it was still really challenging to jump off. 
That's incredibly powerful. So let me ask you, uh, so this, this virtual therapeutics that you're talking about, is this just about uh, distracting the mind whilst the patient is undergoing painful procedures? Is it, just, is it just about hijacking the mind? Yeah, so that's a common question is, what is the mechanism by which virtual reality works? And it turns out mm. it works in many different ways and it depends upon how we're using it and in whom we're using it. So, you know, distraction is certainly one way that it works. Um, you know, neuroscientists call this inattentional blindness. And what that means is if you're, you know, busy paying attention to one thing, you're sort of blind to other phenomena around you. Um, and, you know, we can only keep track of so much at once. Like as we're talking right now, I doubt that you're actively thinking about the feeling of the floor on your feet or your hands on the table. It's not something no, I wasn't. you're actively thinking about. And I'm not thinking about how many times I blinked in the last minute because I can't keep track of all that stuff at the same time. It's just not possible. There's so many things happening. We, can, we have a spotlight of attention. So what VR does is it sort of commandeers that spotlight of attention and can pull it away from noxious stimuli like um, undergoing a spinal tap or having a broken arm uh, fixed in the emergency department, or even it's been used uh, for women undergoing labor and delivery, go, undergoing childbirth. Uh, these are all examples where VR is powerful enough, not always, but in many cases to, to distract. But it does do more than that too, to your question, it also can help build new skills. So for chronic pain, distraction alone is not enough. We need to think about cognitive behavioral therapy, and there's more we can discuss, many other mechanisms by which virtual reality works. Okay, well, I mean, that leads nicely on to my next question, because I'm going to play devil's advocate just for a second, because you're talking about distracting the mind when the mind is in a, a situation where it's experiencing pain by using a virtual reality just to distract it, to hijack it and make it think about something else. But what are the long term benefits for this? Does this help a patient recover quicker and better or is it just for that short term experience? Right. In some instances, it's simply for that experience. But in other instances, it's designed to be used much more durably and with longer term benefits. So, you know, certainly there's nothing wrong with a short term bridge for somebody going through a painful procedure. For example, uh, people with burn injuries undergoing bandage changes. Typically, they'll receive powerful opioid medicines or narcotics. But there's mm. evidence now that using virtual reality is at least as good, if not better than using opioids, but not worse. And it's a drug-free alternative that is highly powerful for helping to bridge that experience. But what we also have found is that even after the headset comes off, people still continue to have some benefits. It's, there's like a pain reduction tail after the headset is removed. And in some people, it lasts a few minutes, but in some people, it lasts hours or even days. It's as if the brain has been temporarily inoculated against the pain. Um, but the real benefits for long-term management have more to do with, with teaching new skills. So for example, we use biofeedback where somebody can go into the headset and they can learn biofeedback breathing. As they breathe in and out, the headset microphone will detect the breathing and then they can change a metaphorical narrative that they're in. For example, they might be in a forest and as they breathe in and out, they can breathe life into a dying tree and the tree will expand and contract like this giant arboreal lung in synchrony with the breathing. And you can literally see your breathing um, in the form of this tree. And with the right um, you know, discussion and description and debriefing, people can learn to, to mediate their pain, to moderate it rather with, um, with breathing activities. And that's just one of many other examples where we can train people through cognitive behavioral therapies how to better manage their pain. Just like if you had a psychologist at home, but people don't have psychologists at home. And there's a huge limitation in the availability of mental health services, particularly now in quarantine with COVID. So this is another opportunity of virtual reality. Well, it, I mean, it sounds incredible. 
And it sounds amazing. And one thing that really struck me when you were talking there, you were talking about um, pain relieving drugs and opiates and, and replacing or being even more effective than traditional means of pain relief, which is amazing, absolutely incredible. But two, two thoughts kind of came to me while we we're talking about that. Um, first of all, I'm thinking to myself, how realistic is this method? Because I'm looking at the cost of a VR unit. And then the second thing that came to mind is, of course, not just the cost of implementation, because uh, you know, the, the VR units are not, are not cheap and neither is the, the, the scenario that is created within them. Uh, but also, I'm also curious to find out how uh, drugs companies and traditional me medicine implementation is responding to this. Because if you can cure pain, or if you can relieve pain with no pain medication, then that's not necessarily a popular choice. <laughs> that's so you bring up some important points. Um, the first thing I'd say is, you know, virtual reality is not some magic wand um, that can just, you know, reduce the need for medicines forever or, or replace completely traditional therapies. It's, it's me meant to augment our traditional approaches. Now, in some cases, it really can reduce the need in some cases completely for medications, but typically it's designed to really augment mental health. And we haven't talked about anxiety and depression and some of the other opportunities here that often are comorbid with, uh, with pain. Uh, but the idea is that it can help um, augment traditional therapies. So drug companies getting to your second question are actually very interested in virtual reality as a digiceutical. You know, they're used to creating pharmaceuticals but a digiceutical is a you know, digital therapeutic that in many cases can augment traditional pharmacotherapies. Uh, so for example, I happen to be a gastroenterologist and we manage a lot of people with irritable bowel syndrome, recurrent abdominal pain, discomfort. Uh -huh. And there really isn't a single pill that will cure that disease. There are many pills that can help with that disease. Um, so many drug companies that make pills for IBS are interested in, can they augment the treatment uh, benefits of their therapy if we create an IBS VR program, which is exactly what we're doing right now. We're creating such a program and working with drug companies. As for the cost of VR, to the first part of your question, on the one hand, sure, uh, it costs a couple hundred dollars to buy a headset, but it's a one-time purchase and the software is anywhere between free and you know in the hundreds of dollars but typically closer to free uh, and we have a list on our website uh, virtualmedicine.org where we have a number of um, software programs most of which are free that we recommend and don't have a, a conflict of interest with so you know yeah the headset is a one-time purchase of opioids cost an awful lot of money uh, not just the pills themselves, but the, consequence, the consequences of those pills, the, um, the severe um, side effects that can lead people to be hospitalized, yeah, for example, the mental health consequences and so on and so forth. And I think an awful lot of people, myself included, would rather find an alternative than reaching out for traditional medication. Because I think that sometimes it can be perceived that that is the easy solution to an instant pain relief, but not dealing with the long-term solution or uh, you know, finding something that is perhaps long-term more, uh, more healthy and better for you. Um, I wanna, uh, Dr. Brennan Spiegel, it's great talking to you. I'm extremely excited about this, uh, but I wanna finish up by asking you about your book, mm -hmm. uh, How Virtual Therapeutics Will revolu Revolutionize Medicine. Is that really gonna happen? Tell me about the book, but also tell me, is there revolution coming in the medicine industry? Yeah, so um, the book is, as you said, called VRX. It's sort of a play on words, you know, RX for therapeutics and VRX is the digital therapeutics. Um, and in fact, the, uh, in the United States, the Food and Drug Administration or FDA, it has actually named this field um, as a formal field of medicine now. Uh, it's called MXR, which stands for Medical Extended Reality. So the fact that's fantastic. That, yeah, the fact that regulators are looking at this speaks to the uh, emergence of this as a as a real 
revolution in essence. Uh, and in the U US, there's over 200 hospitals using virtual reality. So the book is about this field of medicine, but it's more than that. It's really about the boundaries of neuroscience. It's about the intersection between philosophy, psychology, clinical medicine and technology. And it's about what does VR teach us about the way our mind and body are connected. So yes, it's about VR, but I, I spend a lot of, of the book just trying to understand how is it that VR is doing what it does? I, I start with uh, an out of body experience that I have in virtual reality that was engineered to help me understand what it's like to die. And it was so overwhelming to have this out of body experience that I needed to spend some time figuring out just what was happening in my brain. Was I in the matrix or what was going on? And so there's, the book is really about that confluence of sciences and how it's emerging into this new field of medicine that is right now already starting to help people in many different ways. Well, you mentioned the matrix and I've got Star Trek coming to mind because it really is incredibly futuristic, but I'm hoping uh, and I'm, I'm sure that you are very certain that it will revolutionize medicine. And I'm, I'm really thrilled to hear that. And you surprised me as well, because when we were talking about the entry level into implementing this kind of therapeutic uh, um, solutions, it's, the entry level is not that expensive. That's right. It's, it's an accessible technology. We're hoping that insurance companies will begin to pay for it. Uh, at least in the U.S., we've been working with a number of insurance companies who are monitoring the research. And at this point, we don't need a whole lot more research. We actually have over 5,000 studies now examining the benefits of virtual reality, including meta-analyses of randomized controlled trials. So at this point, it's not like we need 5,000 more studies. The question is, how are we going to implement this? Who's going to pay for it? How do we train people? So at Cedar sinai where I work, you see the hospital behind me, we have the largest hospital in the Western United States, and we are starting a full service VR clinic so that people can come to our hospital uh, to receive VR treatment, not just in a research protocol, but as part of their routine care. We're working with our cancer center to help engage patients around their pain and anxiety uh, using VR and with our inpatients to reduce the need for opioids and to um, reduce the length of stay in the hospital. So this is happening right now, it's exciting. Um, and really I think it's a turning point uh, in the use of technology in medicine. Dr. Spiegel, thank you so much for sharing this with us. I'm so excited and I'm wishing you and your team all the very, very best of luck with that. And I will be checking back in with you to see how things are going. But for now, thank you very, very much indeed. Thanks for having me.